Okay, well, hey, thanks so much, Christine. And welcome, Susan Broman. Thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be here. I'm excited, a little nervous. Hey, and it's really cool to be invited to a, an LAPL full staff meeting. So. Yeah, there we go. Welcome all of LAPL. No, this is open to everybody. And yeah, I, yeah. You know, I, I've got a, a few questions to ask Susan. So, uh, you know, we're, we're gonna get started. Basically, you know, I've got some usual questions for Susan, I've got some, I think, questions I thought of between the last uh, one that I did that I'm gonna ask Susan. And um, let you people ask her whatever you like as well. But um, first of all, just to get started then, I'm gonna do just give you a little short bio of her because, well, for those of you maybe who don't work for LAPL, may not know a few of these things, but she is the Assistant City Librarian for LAPL, which serves more than 4 million people, the largest and most diverse urban population of any library in the United States. At her core, Susan is a thoughtful problem solver, and she has applied that skill set to more than two decades of library work in Southern California. She began her career as a children's librarian and has held a wide variety of positions, including branch manager, director of services to adults, webmaster, and head of IT. And Susan feels fortunate to have interacted with fantastic teams along the way and has contributed to a number of groundbreaking projects. And off the top of my head, I'm thinking she's talking about the Career Online High School and Citizenship Corner at LAPL, but probably other things as well. And then uh, beyond her love of libraries, Susan also enjoys uh -oh, tacos, creating origami, uh, learning about technology, discovering new music, trying out organizational systems, and exploring the art museums and galleries of her beloved Los Angeles. So with that, welcome. Thank you. And I think, you know, the, the first thing I like to do with all of these um, conversations is just basically start with, how do we know each other? Because I think a lot about leadership is relationships and I'm not real sure exactly how we met, but maybe you have a better collection than I do. You know, I don't either. I think a lot of it has to do with library land, and in particular, library land in California is a pretty small town. Um, you know, there's a lot of that interconnectivity. Um, uh, I've been involved in different projects that you have also been involved with, but maybe separately. I don't think we've ever been on a committee or anything like, you know, directly, but, um, uh, and, and a lot of the people who I know and trust and work with know and trust and work with you. And I think that makes you know, that reputation, that um, those communities, building your team, you know, that that's what that's all about. So yeah, I, I think it's just kind of been one of those things where like I said, it, library lands a small town sometimes. Yeah, I, I mean, because I, I think I can maybe add a little bit on it. I was thinking about this question this morning about, because when I was talking to uh, Miguel Acosta on Tuesday, we were talking about the fact that uh, your reputation enters the room long before you ever yeah. do. So you always have to keep that in mind. And I'm going to go back to probably when Susan was working at the County of Los Angeles. And there was another Susan who we may hear a little bit more about later, Susan Beyer. And I would just always hear about these two Susans that were just really, you know, <laughs> getting things done. And uh, they were actually, I thought, you know, very quiet about what they were doing. Though. They're, they're not out there broadcasting what I'm doing. They're talking about what their organization is doing. And, you know, I, I think that's real impressive. And then kind of fast forward to maybe, you know, two months ago when I started thinking, well, who do I want to have on uh, to talk to for these conversations? And, you know, to be perfectly honest, the, the one name that seemed to come up a lot was, I think you should talk to Susan ba or Susan Broman <laughs> at, at LAPL, just because I know a couple of people on the, uh, the CLA board specifically said Susan, and then a, a couple of people actually that you work with say that, you know, Susan's awesome. Why don't you have her on? <laughs> okay, we're going to have Susan Broman on. So thank you so much for uh, doing this. So let's get into your leadership journey right now and just, you know, tell us how you got from where you were to where you are right now. Sure. Yeah. It's, so I started out, as you said, as a children's librarian. And um, even before that, I became a children's librarian because when I um, graduated from library school, it was a job skill where there were jobs. 
um, I didn't necessarily feel like um, my passion was serving children. My passion was working in libraries and serving people. And I came to really love being a children's librarian. Um, and I also think it's, it's really foundational to everything I have done since then. Um, because you learn so many fantastic steps about being a manager and a leader. You learn how to talk to different audiences and tailor your message, you know, from toddlers to patrons who are irate because you just had a, a parade throughout the entire library and disturbed their computer time. Um, <laughs> teachers and parents, etc. Um, you learn to um, work with uh, elected officials because everybody is very interested and involved with what is being offered to children in the library. Um, you learn creativity, you learn how to solve problems, you learn probably more than anywhere else, especially at the time, um, about budgeting because you have a programming budget and you learn how to manage that. It's a, um, and that's one of those areas that I think um, is the most difficult thing to, to kind of wrap your head around once you become an administrator is budget. Um, so yeah, I started as a children's librarian, totally loved it, but it kind of got to a point where I felt like uh, I needed to take the next step and was also heavily encouraged by my bosses to take the next step. So I worked in um, a small library up in the uh, high desert. Um, people literally rode their horses to the library and tied, up, tied them up at the bike rack in front of the library. Very different experience from what I had done. Very, very small staffed. Everybody multitasked. Um, and it gave me a really good insight on how to um, manage diverse staff, how to, um, how to delegate, um, and, and how to, was a good experience in realizing there were things that I loved about being a children's librarian that were no longer my job. And I needed to give those over to the person whose job it was and support them in the way that they wanted to do it. Um, and I think that was a really good lesson learned there. Uh, I then moved on to a larger suburban library up in um, Canyon Country and um, was able to work on some big projects there, including introducing self-service to the library system and developing um, robust guidelines on how to make that successful uh, throughout the LA County system. Um, and then I applied for and got the job I had really, really wanted, which was webmaster for um, LA County to develop. Um, uh, and at the time we were developing the, uh, the newest, newer iteration of our website. Um, and I was super excited. And I ended up in that job for about nine months or so before I was convinced to take the job as head of adult services. And I accepted it because I knew it would allow me a greater scope um, and I was able to have a lot of influence over what that job was. And we really morphed it into the adult and digital services. Digital services was really um, at the very early stages when I first started. Ebooks were just starting to be a thing. Um, we did uh, an enormous project with circulating um, Kindles, which is a whole story in itself. Um, and I really had the ability to help to um, look at how we delivered services in a different way. And then um, about four and a half years ago, I made a extremely difficult decision, probably the most difficult decision in my career up to that point, to um, take a job at LAPL and to move into um, a job as head of emerging technology and collections. So it was over IT and technical services. It was not necessarily direct public services. It was really a huge stretch for me. And um, I absolutely love being there. Um, in both places, I've had really great teams to work with um, and really came to appreciate the difference um, of, uh, in the two systems and also really have a good understanding of what my skills and my interests are and when um, the previous assistant city library retired and I was asked to fill in I thought okay I'm, let's let's see how this goes and I just I, I really love it I feel like it's a good fit and has helped me learn a lot about my myself and my style and sometimes that's what it takes taking that leap
Okay, and so just a little bit of clarification. So when you were just a baby children's librarian then, that was with the county? Yes. LA. What branch were, or community library were you at? So I was at the New Hall Library up in Santa Clarita, which is now part of the Santa Clarita Libraries. Um, and then I was up in Little Rock, up in the high desert, and then back to Cape Country, and then down to the library headquarters in town. Looking back, what was your go-to story time book way back then? Uh, Bark George by Jules Pfeiffer. I love telling that story. And then there was this one where, um, I can't even remember the title of it, but it had to do with a video game, and I love telling that story as well. But Bark George, absolute hit for everyone. All ages. Okay, and then <laughs> you mentioned, like, I mean, you became the, the webmaster and you, you really got into IT. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's a stupid question, but where does the children's librarian pick up the, that particular skill set to do, like, basically a 180 there? Yeah, it, it, it looks like it. I, you know, I started as a children's librarian just really being interested in the web and how the web works and um, it, it, as a tool to, for communication. Um, and even well before I started as the webmaster, I um, was contributing to the website by designing um, our summer reading um, pages. Um, and I literally just, at the time, it was much, much easier to be self-taught. This is like mid, where it's like 98 or so. And so I would go into the code and I would look at code at different places and say, oh, here's how you do this, and here's how you do that. And um, just being able to um, use some of the skills that I had. I, I, I started out um, in college thinking that I was gonna be an interior designer. Um, and a design major. And so being able to kind of use those skills, and that's what I love about being a librarian, is you can incorporate your interest and skills into your job in un unexpected ways. And that was one of those situations. So I just got more and more interested in it um, until it became the thing I love doing. Oh, nice. So what would you be doing if you weren't a librarian? Ideally, what would you be doing? So I think ideally, like I said, I started out as an interior design major, and I absolutely love architecture and design. Um, and I, ideally, I would love to be doing something in that field. Um, the main reason I stopped doing it, though, is um, I'm not a great artist. <laughs> I have a good sense of design, but the programs I was looking at also wanted, again, at the time, had a strong art component and um, a, stick figures were cutting it for, <laughs> for things. So that was one of the reasons. And I just, my, I, I took a, a class in college on the humanities, um, which to me was completely eye-opening, being able to look at a wide, and this is, you know, to me a, what librarianship's all about, being able to look at many things going on and looking at how they connect. You know, so how are science and history and art and music all connecting at a certain point and how are they um, I love that about it and so I ended up going more that direction. So where did like libraries come into play in this whole? So um, I, my staff have probably heard that actually both the county and at, at the city have probably heard me talk about this. Um, I ended up in librarianship because I always loved books and reading. I was working in a bookstore um, after college, because um, I graduated in the mid 90s or early 90s, and um, there weren't a huge number of great jobs around. And so um, I was working in bookstores, managing a small independent bookstore in Santa Clarita, and um, I got a letter in the mail from um, Brigham Young University, where I got my undergraduate degree. And they said, um, we are about to close our library school. If you would like to go to library school and get a master's degree in library and information science, now is the time. And I said, you can get a master's degree in library and information science? I would like to investigate that. So I started looking at what that was and how it worked. And, um, and that's what I did. I went back to school became a, to, to get my degree. Yeah, so my first library job was one of the college librarian then as a librarian when I started working for the county. Oh, all right. All right. I'm going to right now ask you, I'm going to put all of the fun questions together right now, if you don't mind. <laughs> and then we're going to get a little bit serious. But um, I, you know, I just want to actually learn more about you as well. So first question, and this is my favorite question to ask 
all the people that I talked to. If we were doing this in front of a live audience, what song do you want playing when you come walking onto the stage? So um, this actually happened. Um, we had a big staff development day. Um, it's hard to imagine a world in which we had 1,200 people in one room, but um, back in November of 2018, and at the kind of the last minute, uh, our, our DJ asked me that. And so my answer uh, at that time, and I think I'd stick to it, was um, Best Coast, The Only Place. Um, and also in retrospect, I would say the Go-Go's um, uh, song, This Town. Both of which are LA centric, but I'm I'm an LA girl. I'm gonna say <laughs> that makes sense. All right, here's a question. I asked this a couple of weeks ago, and this one I want people in the audience to also put your answer into the chat box because I was real surprised at some of the things that people said last time. So, um, Susan, who's the most famous person that you've ever met in audience? Again, I, I'd be very curious to see most famous people use that as well. So um, through the course of uh, my work at LEPL, I, had, I was able to have a conversation with Emilio Estevez after with his work on the, on the public, which was fantastic. Um, outside of work, uh, um, Dave Foley uh, from um, Kids in the Hall and News Radio uh, lived in my building. So we would chat in the elevator every now and then. And then probably the um, kind of most off the wall one was, uh, again, I was sitting in a restaurant and uh, down the bar for me was Skrillex. So <laughs> with who? Skrillex, the DJ. Like, oh, I think okay. he was doing a show nearby and was just hanging out and uh, there were a group of us talking. Yeah, it was, um, it was a little random, but yeah. I'm Impressed that you would recognize him. <laughs> He's very recognizable. And oh, okay. actually, I, I listen to his music as well, so. Well, there's a lot. Wow, there's some. That's awesome. George yeah. Kennedy, Ray Bradbury, George Lucas, Cor Courtney Love, nice. Oh, uh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Cher, Barbara what Streisand, whoa. Cary Grant, I know. Gene Cary Catherine, Grant. that's awesome. <laughs> David Lynch, Britney Spears. Julia Roberts, Rick Springfield. You know, one of the things about living in LA is um, when you do see somebody famous, you like go out of your way to not, mm -hmm. not show that you recognize them or acknowledge them in any way. So you gotta be, you gotta be cool, yeah. Uh, a friend of mine worked at Disneyland and uh, met Michael Jackson while she was there. He was there uh, visiting. Ooh, Dave Grohl, I'd love to meet him. Okay, I'm gonna have to go through this chat later, but I guess, the, whoa, oh my goodness. Okay, we're gonna move on though. Uh, it, it, this is another question that I haven't asked any of the previous guests, although I did this last year when I, I did these interviews in person. It's the, the dinner party question. You can invite three people, living, dead, fictitious, uh, to your house for dinner in beautiful downtown LA. Um, who are you inviting and what are you cooking for them? Um, so I have, my cooking repertoire is not extensive. So I would probably either be cooking tacos or waffles. Those are like kind of two <laughs> go-tos. Okay. Um, um, and for, you know, that's kind of an interesting question in this exact moment in time, because right now my first answer would be my dad because I haven't actually been able to see him in person for eight weeks, although he lives just uh, 20 miles away. Um, you know, having anybody, loved ones into your home to, to sit down and have a meal with right now seems like such a luxury and something that everybody wants. Um, but also, as, as, as thinking about this, since you took me off to this question, um, the, and. This almost surprised me. The first, the first person that came to mind was Nellie Bly, you know, the investigative reporter from the, the year 18 somethings who went around the world and she did like this um, expose of mental institutions at the time. Um, I've always been totally fascinated by her and her groundbreaking um, work. Um, I think she's just amazing. 
And then the, the other thing I immediately thought of as a fictional person is 12-year-old me would have um, answered in a heartbeat, Nancy Drew. Hmm. Um, uh, yeah, like I loved those books as a kid. Probably came as close to writing fan fiction as I ever have in my entire life of thinking about what I would do if I were in those, in those situations. And so, yeah. I never thought about that, but I like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, then one more fun question, then we're going to get serious here. Um, and you can only tell this to me. We'll, we'll turn all the LAPL <laughs> microphones off, okay? So I'm the only one that's going to hear your answer. So what would be um, some fun facts that people don't know about you? Um, you know, I'm actually pretty open book most of the time. I do, um, I love comic books. I read um, comic books probably as much as anything, uh, and any other kind of books, especially right now where um, it's a little, it's very, you know, art and pictures, or art and words together are very engaging. Um, right now, um, I like, uh, I have this um, highly elaborate lighting scheme in my loft so that I can change the color of the lights at night, um, not because I give amazing parties all the time, but I just like colored lights. Um, uh, yeah, and you know, you mentioned my uh, bio, I like to do origami and things with my hands. Um, again, I don't think that's particularly surprising to people who know me or who've been in my office where I have a lot of, of uh, cranes and flowers and things. And by the way, I love you're lighting it in, I'm assuming that's your home office. It looks yeah. like you're, you're in New York City and it's right before New Year's Eve or something. Yeah, yeah. So um, lofts tend to be very dark. I mean, our, my ceiling's dark, my floor is concrete. Um, the, the windows behind me are um, like full sun right now. So it'd be blinding if I had the, the so we've definitely found creative lighting in, in for our apartment. Looks good. And then um, you also mentioned about the comic books. Cause I didn't know this, but I think it was on Tuesday, Miguel Acosta was saying that, and I, I think he's probably right. He, he may have invented the, the concept of gaming, like land gaming in libraries back in like the eighties. Were you like the first person to ever introduce comic books or graphic um, novels into library, public libraries? Or? I don't know if I was the first, but when I was a children's librarian, I became started to become really I didn't I didn't start reading comics until after I became a librarian mm -hmm. and I just really became came to, at first I went to them as a way to encourage reluctant readers and and at the time uh, it was not something that libraries had at all um, but I came to really love them because of the way that stories are told through art and words and how those work together. Um, and so I started talking about them with other people at LA County um, and making the case for why we should include them in the collection, why we should have um, do purchasing. Um, it was way back when we used to still do, um, you know, where we would go to a store, I would go to Golden Apple Comics and have like $200 to spend and just pull things that I knew that the kids in my community would love. And um, it, was, it was great and we really started to um, talk to our staff about what comics could mean to um, not just kids, but you know, other um, people in the community that they were, um, yeah, art and words to tell stories. So, you know, what's more basic? Well, right now, we're, we're going to maybe change the, the tone of our conversation right now, <laughs> maybe get a little bit more into leadership in crisis. And I actually did want to actually, I, I talked earlier about the two Susans that I knew in um, LA County, Susan Broman and Susan Byer. And I mean, she came in all the way from uh, Paducah, Kentucky. So I just thought, well, let me, she can ask you this next question. So let me unmute her and then um, hopefully she can ask it for you. So go ahead, Susan. Hello. Hello, California. Hi. 
your Kentucky Zoom bomber here, Susan. It's great to see everybody. <laughs> so I do have a question about leadership. So I am always interested in learning how to be a better emotional role model for my team. Similar to how if you're on a plane and you hit turbulence and the flight attendant looks calm, you stay calm how to model that kind of behavior for your staff in times that are frankly quite terrifying? That is a good question. <laughs> you know, I think of it, uh, you know, I have always been a person who tries to maintain it to be as calm as I can. And, and I think really going back to that training is a branch manager where you know you learn those skills of how to um, you know somebody is shouting at you how to um, maintain your composure be professional um, and um, clearly communicate the message that you're trying to get across um, and also I think it's um, important to acknowledge that um, if you feel scared and you feel um, afraid, um, in fact, I have a quote that's on my desk right now that says, it's from, it's from uh, Philip Glass, actually, that says, I don't know what I'm doing, and that's what makes it interesting. Um, and sometimes um, acknowledging that up front to people and, and then just kind of working through it, I, I feel like that. A huge part of my job is modeling that behavior and trying to think about what would I want my leaders, how would I want them to be um, in this particular situation. Um, it is uh, it, it, it is a is a tricky thing, and I think going also going back to the your baseline, and my, for me, my baseline is um, our staff and our public. Like what what can we do? What can I say? What kind of actions can I take that will um, will um, center them at decisions and and, um, and communication? So, what have you learned about yourself as a leader in these particular times, the leading in crisis, basically? Um, I have learned that I can be bossy if I come if it comes right down to it. Uh, there were several times when, um, especially in the role of, um, and I don't even know if other people think that I'm doing this, but in my from my perspective, this is me like being like this is how we're doing it. Um, but I would come in and say, okay, here's the plan, here's what we're going to do, here's how it's going to go, and I actually feel a lot more comfortable doing that than I had thought I would. Um, um, and, and I, uh, people have often heard me here say over the years, um, anybody who's been on any kind of committee with me will have heard me say this. I will often say is, um, who is the boss of this? Who is the boss of this thing, this project, this process, this whatever? And um, that is actually probably one of my go-to things as well. Like, who is the boss of this? And sometimes the answer is, it's me. And, and then that's, uh, sometimes defining that is easier, makes it easier to proceed. Hey, and thank you so much also, Susan Beyer, for coming all the way from Kentucky just to I join us. I know, you. that's so awesome. It's great to see you. We'll send you back. But if you want to hang around after we, we finish this, well, then stick around and we can try to catch up as well. Um, okay, uh, kind of related, I guess, to what's going on right now is with um, I, I, what have you seen uh, from other libraries in California that have really impressed you during these times of crisis? And, uh, Go ahead and start with LAPL if you like. And I'm just gonna mention a couple of things that I've seen you people do that have been really impressive. Uh, and I don't know if they're even on, on this particular call or not, but I, I saw um, Chris Kiefer did these kind of DIY, this is how you use your database from home. And I thought, yeah, this is really good. And I know um, Jay, um, Joanna Fabicon was doing her story times. And I actually watched a couple of them and. You know, Mark Horton has, has done a, a few things, but well, other things that you've seen either at LAPL or around the state that you're thinking, well, okay, libraries are stepping up here. 
Yeah, I, really, there's so many examples, and you know, to kind of build on that, a lot of that um, online programming, almost all of it, were um, things that our staff um, just gravitated toward almost immediately from the time that we closed. Um, they were starting to think about online story times. Um, and we have, and you know, as uh, John Zabo, my boss says, you know, we really want to let our staffs be their fabulous selves, you know, just be out there and do their thing. And we've certainly have guidelines around um, virtual programming and things, but it's so valuable, especially in the, especially in the early days, but through this whole thing that our communities can see familiar faces, that they can know that they can go to their local library Instagram account and see the children's librarian. And we've seen, I've seen some great pictures that where parents have sent in um, to their life, to the librarian of their kids just transfixed by seeing their librarian on the screen um, doing story times. And, and being that, you know, you know, in, in schools and, in, and as a children's librarian, you talk a lot about the community helpers, you know, the firemen, the police officers, the mail carriers. And librarian is one of those, and being that person in this circumstance, and, and I've seen that all over, you know, the, the state and the country, of, um, you know, library directors like Susan doing story time from her, um, you know, from her home with her cat, or people, you know, in, engaging their kids and doing the little cooking demo, and um, really being that person in that community. I think that's been so essential. Um, I'm really impressed with um, those library systems where, like us, are, are engaged in working as disaster service workers. Mm -hmm. um, and really um, bringing the skills that we learn as, library, uh, as librarians and library staff members um, to, and applying those to helping people in need making phone calls um, for an uh, LAPL. We have dozens and dozens of our staff um, answering um, senior meal hotline calls. And, um, the, you know, they, they get the, as you can imagine, people who are in distress, people who are in need, people who are angry, people who are um, just you know, calling partly because they need somebody to talk to. You. And the skills that we've tried to develop in our staff, and, and again, across the country, across the state, um, I think has really been helpful to communities um, in doing that work. Um, it's, it's so impressive. Um, and then just the information sharing that everybody's doing across the state is, is fantastic. Let's you know, just talk that people share their plans. Um, we're, you know, it feels almost cliche to say we're all in this together, you know, that's, but um, it, it feels like that for sure in one race. Okay, and then, I, I mean, I guess I'll better totalize a little bit here, but I, I really do get impressed with the things that, for example, you're doing in your system, but I, I know there's a lot of other really great things that are happening, but in, in it's my, it would be my observation that at least in LAPL, there really is some kind of a trust and you know, a sense of empowerment and a sense of safety from your people that they, they, they're willing to do these kind of things and right. they know that it's, you know, it sounds like there, it was very, uh, they initiated these things and it, that's rare. I, I mean, not every place is gonna, I, I don't think that the people feel like, oh, I, I can do this and you know, I'm not gonna get my hand slapped or you know, whatever it is, so good for you. And again, good for the people at LAPL that are just doing uh, great things for your communities. So we've been working on this um, leadership development project called Take the Lead, um, where we, John, John and I have very purposely been working with our staff to develop leadership at every level. And what that really means is that um, it, we're not just paying a lip service as a way to, you know, check this off our list. Leadership development done. Um, but we want this to be something that's the very core of who we are as um, LAPL. Um, we're now in our um, second year of that. And the work we have done there 
I feel like has made this entire process um, so much, I don't, don't wanna say easier, easier is not the right word, but has given us a lot more tools to work with um, in, in helping everybody get through this. Mm. Okay. Oh, and one other thing I just remembered too. Yeah, thanks, Mandy, for giving getting me an e card from LAP. <laughs> My wife very happy as far as being able to, to check out more books, and she's gone through everything here in Pasadena. <laughs> All right. Next question is: um, You you did a program at the PLA conference a bit ago. It was called "So You Don't Want to Be a Library Director." <laughs> <laughs> Come on, do you really mean that or what? Or, and, and if you really do mean that, well then what kind of advice would you give? Uh, maybe not only to people in like the number two position, but you know, uh, maybe a little bit more about the concept of just leading from any position. Yeah. I, I really, um, I do totally mean it. Um, you know, I, of course I, I would never, I, I, I try to never completely close the door on anything. But um, for me where I am in my career, um, this is a, a great fit for me. And I think the reason for that is, and I mentioned this earlier, is um, I've really come to know my own strengths um, and what I um, am, am energized by and what I feel like I am good at. And those things are around systems and managing projects and solving problems and operations. Um, the part of being a director of um, doing fundraising and um, working with, in, with you know, politicians and um, I can do it, but it's, it's much more draining for me than um, solving problems and operations. And so, um, and, and one of the things in, in, in our conference, um, Talk, one of the things that we really talked about is a panel discussion was um, knowing your strengths and it being okay to be find your find your niche and really dig in on that and excel at that you know, still be open to opportunities but it's okay it, you know if if this is what you want to be doing and you love it and you're you're your best self at doing this that's awesome. You don't always have to be saying, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. It's, there's not, you know, it, it's okay. Be you. Um, <laughs> um, but um, I, I also, you know, it's, uh, I, I, like I said, I, being able to, uh, you know, working with um, a, a really fantastic director um, and, and John and uh, we work as a team with our admin team and to really uh, talk about what is, you know, the direction of LAPL and how we um, want to, uh, to lead that, I, you know, it's such a fantastic opportunity. So, so yeah, for me, this is, um, this is great. When early on in my career, um, as I was a children's librarian, I had an opportunity to um, fill in as a, a regional youth services coordinator, county folks all know what I'm talking about there. And um, somebody very snarkily to me said, um, oh, you're so ambitious. And at the time, I was horrified that somebody would think that I was ambitious. Because again, that's just kind of who I am. I'm not um, that, you know, it's, that's just not me. But um, now that I, you know, after years of getting to know myself better, um, if you're ambitious, that's great, you know? Embrace that. That is that's an important thing to be. Um, it, it's not you know for somebody to use something like that as a way to say, you know, something negative about you. I think is just not uh, not an acceptable way to to be. Like be yourself. And and to me, being myself is is this, is this position. Okay, so let's get back to the question. So you really don't want to be a library director? Then? I really don't. Yeah, I really don't. Again, I would never say, you know, I, I, I'm never going to be like, I would never have to do that um, in my entire lifetime. Yeah. But at where I am right now, no, no, no interest at all. Hmm. Okay, <laughs> okay. I'm going to ask you the hardest question that, well, at least other people who've been on the other end of this one said was, 
probably the hardest question. It's like that your strengths and weaknesses question you get in an interview, but um, all right. So looking back over your professional career, what's like maybe the, the one biggest mistake that you can talk about that you've made and you know, what was the fallout from it? What did you learn from it? And then how did you move forward from it? You know, this is always a funny question for me because, um, you know, I've obviously made a tons and tons of mistakes, but the ones that I always raise to, that I always think about are the ones that are like, they were not major. They were more like funny things that I learned a good lesson from. Um, I think with bigger things, uh, I try to, to, it's constantly evolving. The something, a decision was made, it wasn't the right decision, but then, then maybe you're instantly adjusting and evolving and trying to change it. And, and maybe I just really take to heart for them forget, you know, forgive myself for those things and forget them. But uh, the one I always think about from when I was a, a children's librarian is I decided to do a um, story time about teeth for toddlers, you know, so for like three and four year olds. Um, didn't have, I, I, don't, I don't have children of my own, and so I didn't have, have, have very much experience at the time, and didn't really realize that those children barely got their teeth, and most of the stories for children about teeth were about losing your teeth, and getting, losing your baby teeth, and I had kids crying, they were, <laughs> they, like, the, only the, some of the kids who had older brothers and sisters knew that this was a thing that was happening, but the younger ones were, like, absolutely terrified. <laughs> and I learned an uh, important lesson about um, knowing your audience and crafting your message. But um, it was, it was pretty tragic uh, a situation. But, like, those are the things that, like, kind of stand out to me the time I spent trying to make librarianship work in Second Life, for example, it doesn't work. Um, you know, it's not a big thing. I think the big things, and I really like try to morph and move forward and um, take and, and, you know, make, you either make it work or abandon it and move on. Yeah. Okay, and maybe kind of along the same lines. So what are the kind of things that keep you up at night? Um, at, right now, I'm safety of my staff, like absolutely, 100%. Um, and also, what happens with um, the city I love as we move forward out of this? Um, I, I, you know, I live in downtown Los Angeles. I see um, people suffering. Um, I'll, I'll, you know, every time I go out my door, and um, the and there. I have to accept that there are things that I can have influence over and things mm -hmm. that I cannot. And that is probably the thing that um, worries me the most. And then of course, you know, uh, you know, family and, 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 and everything going on, but I'm really looking at how we move forward as a library system and be safe and uh, we talked a lot about this, um, John and I, and the, um, our administration team, um, how we move through this as um, a healthy organization, um, not just um, you know, physically, but also making sure we're talking to each other, making sure that um, we all have our best interests at heart. Communication was um, at the very top of our priorities as we were closing libraries and, and sending people home to work from home. Okay, it's actually a question that came up in the Q&A and I, I was gonna say this for the end, but it, maybe it, it also kind of ties into a little bit about what you're talking about because I suspect you're very good at this, but um, how do you manage change? And especially at, at an organization like LAPL, which is like, you know, it's a battleship and you're not turning 180 degrees in the middle no. of the ocean anytime soon. So how do you get buy-in or maybe even start with where the ideas come from? And then if someone had an idea, how do they filter that thing up to get it heard? And then once it happens, how do you implement it as far as getting people to buy into it, how to do the implementation of it and all those kajillion other things that are, um, would affect uh, if you wanted to do something at LAPL. So um, I, 
personally, and again, this is the thing I've learned about myself, I love change. I thrive on change. Um, I have also realized that that is not everyone. And it's part of my responsibility to identify that and find out what will um, make people comfortable and at ease as change is happening. Um, my ideal way to do this, uh, to do this is really to get up broad cross section of people in a room and talk it out. And I think that's one of the most difficult things for me during all of this is that is not a tool that I have. Zoom rooms are um, what we have and they're, but um, it's not the same as having people around the table and somebody and saying, here's the problem. What are some solutions? And somebody saying, sometimes it's under their breath. They're like, oh, maybe we should try this. And you're like, what was that? And it turns out that that is a great solution. Um, but um, so uh, I think we've, we've been trying really hard with the Take the Lead project that I spoke of earlier. And then we've also been doing a um, safety and security project initiative where we have actively um, work, we've been working with a consultant to actively engage our staff in, in conversations about what it means to be safe in the workplace. Um, and, and trying to, and, and that is, um, we're a big organization. You know, we have 1,200 employees. We're scattered over um, 73 locations. Um, and trying to engage everybody and be systematic about saying, okay, we have heard a lot from this, this group of people, but we haven't heard from this group of people and being very intentional about gathering input from different classifications, different departments, you know, being as equitable as we can. Um, it is a lot of work and sometimes, you know, especially in crisis situations, you end up, having to move forward without all that. I think Miguel talked a little bit about that too. Um, and that is difficult, especially if you are used to, like Mike has said, my favorite way of solving a problem, get a bunch of people in the room, figure out what we're doing, come out of there with an action plan and then do it. Um, but I, you know, it all comes back to communication. Okay, so right now I'm going to encourage the people, if you have a, a question for Susan, and I, I've noted down some of them that I've already seen in the chat and the Q&A, and I will ask them, but if there are, you know, some other things, well then uh, feel free to do it. And in the meantime, two more questions, and these are going to be just fun ones. Um, one, so what have you been doing if you have a little bit extra time on your hands now, maybe a TV show you've been binge watching or, you know, Oh, yeah. uh, some book you've been reading, magazine, website you like. Tell me I, about it. I kind of laughed at this because I have less time now than I ever have in my entire life, honestly. I, you know, that whole kind of joke about, oh, you work from home, uh, means that I'm literally at work all the time. Um, but I do really love um, to, like when I need to just turn it off, um, I love baking. I've been doing more baking than I have for years mm -hmm. um, over the, the last little bit, which probably isn't the healthiest thing to do, but it's fun. I enjoy it. I like baking because it's very precise, right? You measure, mix. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, I, will, um, I, I will watch um, very short things on social media, like cats of Instagram posts and um, videos about people organizing their pantries. I don't know why I'm so obsessed with this, but I am. Um, or uh, TikTok, my niece is on TikTok, and so I'll scan through TikTok for a little bit because it's like super real, but it's really fascinating. Um, yeah, but I have all of these, I had all these ideas of things that I would be able to finish and do. I have this elaborate paper fold of paper craft project that has been like halfway done for months now. Um, I just, I haven't had a huge amount of time uh, to work on any of it, unfortunately. 
Not the, no, no television favorites then, huh? You know, I am actually not a huge television TV watcher. Um, I did, of course, my absolute, so my two favorite TV shows of all time are The Wire and um, Parks and Rec. And um, I did watch the Parks and Recreation um, special that was, it was, which was fantastic. I just love that show so much. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of shows I lo I do enjoy watching, um, but I haven't had a chance to. I'm, I've got Bosch in my queue waiting to see, watch the, the next season of that and um, a, a few other things. Spoiler alert, Bosch season six, very good. You like it. I love it because it's filmed in my neighborhood. Like the shows yeah, are, right, right, are right. places I walk by all the time. It's, <laughs> it's really fun. I also just love the show. So. Okay, so the last formal question I have and the way I, I end all of the interviews or the last question, favorite book, favorite movie, favorite music, favorite food, go. All right, so um, I believe I'm contractually obligated to say my favorite book is The Library Book by Susan Orlean. Um, actually, I really do love that book. Um, and probably one of my favorite books is um, The Orchid Thief um, because I love true tales of obsession. Um, I also read a lot of uh, mystery and um, I've really been loving um, uh, science fiction lately, um, particularly um, Octavia Butler and, um, and Kay Jemison. Right. So movies. Um, I have the movie taste of like a 14 year old boy. I like action movies where dudes get kicked in the head. So kind of my favorite movies, which I guess maybe might be a quirky thing about me as well. Um, I, I love John Wick. In fact, I've got a little John Wick dude back here somewhere. Um, and uh, probably um, uh, Atomic Blonde, love, love those two movies. Um, and for music, um, I listen to all, all the music all the time. Um, probably my favorite right now, um, just because they have a fairly recent album out is um, Best Coast. Um, but I love Amy Winehouse and The National and The Replacements. Um, all time, my favorite band's probably X. They actually have a new, new album out too. Yeah, they, um, they were or they're, they're on tour or they were going to go. Yeah, on they just put a, their new their first um, studio album in like years and years and years this week. Um, I've seen them in concert probably at least a dozen times, if not more. <laughs> Um, and then with the replacements, um, we actually postponed our honeymoon one day um, to go see the replacements live uh, the day after we got married. Um, but I really do listen to absolutely everything. Hip hop, Americana, punk. Um, I, I almost always have music on. I tend to listen to music more than I would watch TV, for example. And then for food, um, I think I've mentioned tacos 27 times today, so. The 28th time, but yeah, I'm not so counting. Is, yeah, that's a big one. And LA is like, I know these are fighting words, but LA is the best food town. Um, uh, you know, pho, ramen, Korean barbecue, Tommy's, in and out uh, everything from, you know, high dining to, um, you know, uh, corner hot dog, you know, bacon wrap hot dogs. Um, LA is fantastic, but uh, my go-to is probably going to always be uh, tacos. Best place to eat the Grand Central Market. Grand Central Market is so great. And again, they get such a broad range of things. You get uh, vegan ramen, which is amazing. You get, there's the meat, uh, Bel Campo meats. Um, Probably my favorite thing, though, is um, Tomas y Tugras, which is, you know, these enormous burritos and tacos that are really expensive. Actually, the correct answer is egg slut, but that's uh, just me, I guess. So I have, 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 have feelings about standing in line for a, an egg sandwich, so. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. It is pretty easy to make, actually. Yeah, they, they are really, really good. They're good with you on, but yeah. <laughs> All right, well, let me go through uh, some of the questions that I've written down that I've seen come across. Uh, for, how long did you work at LA County for? I worked there for 20 years. Whoa. Okay. Yeah, I was there for a long time. And then do you want to give a little bit of the, the thought process behind what made you decide to move to? Um... You know, um, the job came up at LAPL that um, looked like it was, I, I literally, 
I had at least half a dozen people send me the job description saying, this sounds like me. Um, and so I thought a lot about it. Um, it is not an easy thing to, um, I'm not, and I'm not saying this to make myself sound like I'm the hero or anything, but it is a really difficult decision to leave an organization that we've been with for 20 years where I really, um, it came to you know love. I had a fantastic team there, um, who I would have stolen entirely if I could have. Um, I had you know I really loved the organization. Had a lot of great experiences, um, but also I think it's important to recognize when it is time to try something new, get out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Um, and this was well out of my comfort zone, um, and, um, and and make a change. And it worked out fantastically. I absolutely love my team at LQL. Um, the staff is amazing, um, and um, people are just so uh, willing to try new things and and move forward. Which you know they they were in both organizations. It's funny, like people always ask me, like, what are the differences and um, there's mostly similarities. Um, some of the differences are like vocabulary. To this day, I'm still referring to certain things using county terminology as opposed to city terminology. But um, when, at its core, they're very, they're very, very similar. Yeah. Hmm. All right. And then a question: is, What kind of advice would you give to either new librarians or uh, recent graduates? Uh, during these times or you know how do you how would you say you know how to prepare for what's going to happen how to prepare. um i think it, just being curious and being open um to opportunities um I, I, so when i after i got my library degree um we moved back to Los Angeles. I started looking for a job. It was a time period where um, there was a hiring freeze almost everywhere. Um, and then the North Ridge earthquake happened. We lived on the other side of where all the freeways fell down. So, um, uh, and it took me a year to find a job. Um, it took me six months to even be able to drive out of the San Florida Valley. Um, and, but during that time, I looked for opportunities that would help build my skills, um, kept my eyes open. Um, um, I volunteered at, you know, putting books back on shelves at a couple of libraries. Um, it's, you know, uh, and I'll, as much as I would love to say um, to those folks, everything's going to turn out great. You know, I don't. I also don't believe in saying things that I don't have any control over. It may or may not be true, but, um, but you know what? I, I've talked about this before. Libraries have been around for over 150 years, public libraries. Part of our strength is that history, um, that we build on that and we grow uh, on that. And I think um, looking to that as inspiration, I think is um, helpful. Um, but I would also to say, look, you know, look at your skills, build your skills, and know, um, and be willing to try, try some new things that you might not, thought you would have two months ago. Okay, so I, last, qu last formal question that someone asked, and then um, can you like stick around for, I don't know, 10 minutes after this is officially over because yeah, you know, what, what I'm going to do, I'll ask the question and we'll wrap up and then we're going to turn the recording off. So, if, you know, specifically, you know, maybe with the people from LAPL, if you want to ask something of Susan, that's not going to get recorded. Well, then you're welcome to do that. But um, question as far as um, what is your favorite taco recipe? Oh, I'm like super. Um, I love carnitas with um, onions, you know, with onion cilantro and uh, lime, like pretty basic, but that, that's my go-to. The, uh, when, I, when I make stuff at home, I tend to make uh, 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 either uh, like a ranchera type of a taco or chicken, but going out, uh, it's almost always kind of off, off the top. And then I'll start to branch out. All right, okay, so 
Susan Berman, you got a webcam here, you got a webcam here, you got a webcam <laughs> there. What do you want to say to the people out there in library land? Well, I, you know, there's so much to say right now, right? Um, I think it's really uh, be remembering who we are, what our values are, what our, um, what our missions are, which is to connect people with the, what they need to succeed or to get through this or to survive. I mean, sometimes people come to, you know, well, we'll complain, well, not well, complain actually probably is the word, but we'll say, oh, people just want DVDs. They're just stuck in a button, you know. But if that's what it takes for somebody to um, be able to face their, what they, what the, their reality, then that's what they're, we're there to provide. Um, really, like everything we do is impactful to our community and keeping that as our baseline, really coming back to that over and over again. What are the needs of our community and how are we serving them? Um, what are the needs of our staffs and how are we able to, you know, to provide for those? That's my baseline every time. And I think it's important for us to remember. Nice. Okay. Hey, thank you so much, Susan. I, I'm just going to maybe make one little final comment and then we'll go into overtime. But I, I, I'm hoping that, and I'm probably the people in LAPL already know this, but you know, maybe for people that don't know Susan as well, or maybe this is the first time you're, you're ever seeing her, well then, I think she's just an outstanding example of just a great leader who is not, you know, ego-driven, who is authentic, you know, maybe a little bit soft-spoken, but she's good at what she does. And I think the takeaway you should all get is, you know, if you are maybe not the kind of person that likes to see your name in lines or, um, you know, whatever it is that if you're really good at, at what you do, like Susan is, your name will get out, your reputation will get into that room before you ever do. And, um, you know, I personally think it's just something to really aspire to is to just, you know, just be very quiet, be very confident, uh, quietly confident. She's not quiet, but quietly confident. And um, it, it can take you very far. So thank you so much, Susan. Thank you. Thanks. This has been a pleasure. It's okay. great to see all, all, the, all the folks. And actually, a, a few other questions came in. And I, I'm going to turn the, or Kristen, can you turn the re recording off at this point? And 